Good afternoon and welcome to the patient webinar hosted by M House. My name is Tina Rolis and I'm here with the M House Executive Director Diane Doherty and our discussion panelists Dr. Joe Tobin, Dr. Stacy Watt, and Cheryl Mercer. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few things to help this web webinar go as smoothly as possible. First, let's go over some housekeeping items. The orange arrow that you see on the control panel will allow you to open and close this panel. As this is an open discussion webinar, we encourage you to we encourage you to ask questions either verbally or written. The questions box is where you'll submit any written questions. If you'd like to ask your question verbally, click on the hand symbol in the control panel in the upper right hand corner of your screen to raise your hand and you will be unmuted. Let's go ahead and give it a try to make sure everything is working as it should be. Please click the hand symbol to raise your hand. Oh, wonderful. Um, we don't have a full attendance just quite yet, um, so if anybody has any questions going forward, feel free to go ahead and um, post that question in the questions box and I will get to you as soon as I can. If you also cannot find the hand um, symbol, go ahead and send me a message in the questions as well. Thank you guys very much. Uh, to achieve our goal of answering all of, our question, all of your questions, we ask that you keep your questions short. If by chance we don't get to you, don't worry. We will respond either in the chat or via email. This webinar is being recorded and will be placed on our website at a later date. Are there any questions regarding how you can engage with us? And your questions can be submitted in that questions box. Okay, great. I would like to thank each of our panelists for volunteering their time to help us with this webinar. Let's hear who they are. Dr. Tobin? Hi, this is Joe Tobin. I'm an anesthesiologist from Wake Forest University, and I've been a member of the M-House board and a hotline consultant for 10 to 15 years. Wonderful, thank you, Joe. Um, Stacy. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Stacy Watt. I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist from Buffalo. I've been a member of M House for a number of years and currently serve as both a hotline consultant and a member of the board of directors. So in addition to bringing my knowledge of pediatric anesthesia to this webinar today, I'm also going to bring my athletic background. I'm a two-time NCAA All-American in the discus event and represented the United States in the Pan American and Olympic festivals. Um, I have an interest in pediatric anesthesia, malignant hyperthermia, and athletics, which all come together in my research focus, which is trying to find out more about heat-related illnesses and MH. So I look forward to speaking with all of you today. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Stacey. Wonderful. Okay, Cheryl? Hi, I'm Cheryl Mercer from West Branch, Iowa. I'm an MH-susceptible patient who experienced a fulminant episode in 1986 during a routine appendectomy. I've been a member of M House for many years, and I'm also new to the M House board. Um, I appreciate being part of today's webinar. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cheryl. All right, we're going to get started with our first poll question to see how many of you are, are paying attention to us so far. Are you MH susceptible? Just select one, yes, no, or you are a healthcare provider. And we'll give everybody just a few seconds here to, to weigh in. Okay, just a couple more seconds. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and show everybody what we um, what the results were. So 75% of our audience are indeed MH susceptible, 6% is not, and 19% are healthcare providers. So that's that's pretty interesting. Um, Dr. Tolman is going to give a brief presentation about MH, and then we will open up the discussion. Dr. Tobin? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us for this webinar. I've got about a 10 to 12 minute presentation and about 10 slides, and I'd like to go through some of the basics about malignant hyperthermia. This uh, information is, a, it's my attempt to distill it for a, a non-medical population, but I expect that most MH susceptible patients know some of this information already. Uh, and what we'll do is uh, we'll go through a little bit of the current uh, knowledge about MH and some of the irregularities that are involved with uh, our, our scientific understanding about heat-related illness as well. 
So for our title slide, I've tried to give a definition for malignant hyperthermia as a, a disease and or as a syndrome. And essentially, it's a disease that requires what we consider to be two components. You first have to be genetically susceptible to it because you've had an alteration in your gene. And then the second is you have to receive a triggering agent, which are one of the commonly used anesthetic agents. So we call the disease a pharmacogenetic disease, and it's triggered in susceptible people by the agents that we use every day in anesthesia. Once the syndrome is triggered, the muscles become hypermetabolic, meaning they use their energy very fast. And as they use all the energy available to them, uh, they begin to break down and destabilize, and then they will release one of the ions that are inside the cells in high concentration called potassium. And when the potassium concentration in the bloodstream begins to get high, it will begin to cause an irregular heartbeat because it interferes with the conduction system of the heart. Fever may accompany the illness, but it is not always there. But if the potassium cannot be brought under control and the illness cannot be brought under control, then uh, the patient may uh, have a fatality due to the syndrome not having been sufficiently diagnosed and or treated. The, um, the signs of malignant hyperthermia may be familiar to most of you, and the problem is many of the signs are nonspecific. They are high heart rate, known as tachycardia, uh, fast breathing rate, known as tachypnea, Acidosis, where we build up acid in the bloodstream, and some of it comes from the muscles, and some of it is because we accumulate carbon dioxide. The high potassium I've spoken of, and there may or may not be the presence of a fever. Those are all signs that could be symptoms of someone having um, another type of serious infection, so they're not all specific to malignant hyperthermia. On the left side of the slide are some of the more specific signs of malignant hyperthermia. In particular, muscle rigidity, when someone's on the operating table, we consistently now measure the uh, partial pressure or the concentration of carbon dioxide as we breathe out gases while we're under anesthesia. And finally, after the muscle rigidity doesn't have enough energy anymore to stay rigid, the muscle cells break down and they release their potassium. And the breakdown of muscle is also called rhabdomyolysis. So as MH susceptible individuals or family members, what do you need to know uh, as you prepare to go in for elective surgery? Well, understand that the, you may never hear the words malignant hyperthermia susceptible because that's a complicated phrase that may actually scare a number of people. So what an anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist will most often do is ask you as a patient, is there any family history of a death or an unusual event that occurred around the time of surgery or anesthesia? And for those who don't know, anesthesia is used for a lot more than just surgery. It's used for colonoscopies, endoscopies, for patients who need to be sedated for an MRI. Um, so anesthesia is not always used only for surgery. It's used for diagnostic procedures. And so it's the anesthesia is the trigger. So it's important to tell anyone who's going to be giving you anesthesia about susceptibility in yourself or in your family. If there's a suspicion of malignant hyperthermia in the family because of some unusual clinical encounter, you need to be able to discuss that with the anesthesia provider so they can determine if they should uh, change to use what we call clean technique drugs, meaning drugs that do not trigger uh, malignant hyperthermia. These have their own risks and are not necessarily a perfect alternative, but it's certainly these drugs are known not to go ahead and uh, trigger a malignant hyperthermia episode. As part of our conversation this afternoon, we're beginning to unravel a little bit of knowledge about why patients with chronic muscle diseases may be more susceptible to being malignant hyperthermia susceptible than we've ever known in the past. So does any family member have a chronic muscle symptom, whether or not there's been a formal diagnosis, and or does someone suffer from recurrent heat stroke or excessive cramping? And uh, these are all important conditions to discuss with the anesthesia provider prior to uh, performance of an elective anesthetic. And again, remember that anesthesia is used very frequently for children and adults for diagnostic procedures. The spectrum of presentation of malignant hypothermia comes in two 
the common forms. The least common is the most severe. And that is where the, the malignant form of malignant hyperthermia occurs ultra rapidly. And in a matter of a few minutes, there can be generalized muscle breakdown and release of large amounts of potassium, which can make the heart unstable. That is fortunately not the most common feature that we see. The more common presentation, we've labeled the form frust, like frustration. The, the disease is not showing itself fully, and so it's slowly evolving, and this can occur over many minutes to even hours. And the condition can continue to appear even in the first few hours after an anesthetic has been discontinued. So that is why we continue to monitor patients' vital signs in the recovery room and as they first get transferred to the floor or to the intensive care unit following surgery. We look for signs of uh, not only generalized muscle rigidity, but in certain circumstances, we have the medical term that is called isolated masseter muscle rigidity. The masseter muscle is the one that helps to clench the jaw. And so after the anesthetic has begun and the anesthesia provider attempts to put the breathing tube in, they find great resistance to getting the mouth open uh, and the teeth are often clenched together. And that is known as masseter muscle rigidity. And that clearly overlaps with malignant hyperthermia susceptibility. We'll discuss a little bit about other uh, disorders associated with um, malignant hyperthermia. And then we'll also brush upon uh, when MH might occur without anesthesia as a trigger. And this may occur from environmental stress, heat stroke, or in patients who've had recurrent exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis. Now, for all of you to understand for your own safety, the, the greatest danger from a malignant hyperthermia crisis is that there's a large breakdown of muscle and it releases high levels of potassium and it makes the heart unstable and it makes the cardiovascular system collapse. It is not terribly common, but it's the, it's the catastrophic presentation of malignant hyperthermia that all anesthesia providers are educated about. And that's why we keep the drug gantrolene as a rescue medication available in all hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers. The more subacute causes of mortality, and this would occur with the form thrust or the malignant form, and then these appear as complications over the next 24 to 48 hours, include having the blood not coagulate well, that's known as DIC. You can have multi-organ failure where the organs are all injured because of the proteins being released from the muscle. You can have kidney failure and you can also have swelling of the brain. And any one of those can be a cause of subacute mortality of malignant hyperthermia. So even after the initial treatment, patients are monitored and treated for the first 24 hours minimum in the intensive care unit. Now, many of you may be wondering about the advances that have occurred in MH genetic testing. For those who have not understood that there are different types of tests, the most common or gold standard test to determine if someone is MH susceptible is the muscle biopsy test, and the muscle is taken live to the laboratory, and it is put under circumstances where it's exposed to caffeine or halothane or both, and then we test and we look for the contraction of the muscle and make a determination if it's a normal contraction or if it's a hyper contraction, meaning excessive and that's indicative of the muscle being susceptible in a malignant hyperthermia susceptible patient. Now, the more, the more novel testing has only been available over the last 10 plus years, and that is called genetic testing. And the number one focus of where there's a genetic mutation or alteration uh, in our DNA is looking at a, at a, a DNA sequence for a protein called the RYR1 protein. And so if in the DNA that is about to be transcribed into that protein uh, has a mutation, then there's a possibility the patient will be MH susceptible. But here's the difficulty. Already, we've been able to determine that there are more than 400 mutations that occur in the RYR1 DNA. But only 35 to 40 mutations have thus been considered causative of MH because they've been found in two separate families and they've been confirmed with biopsy testing 
that they, these mutations result in what appears to be an MH susceptible individual. So if a person goes for genetic screening and the person tests positive for one of the 35 to 40 mutations, we can call that individual MH susceptible. However, if they have one of the other 400 mutations, their status is unclear. We do not know which of those other, as of yet not called causative mutations, might actually be causative. So for a patient or a family member, if a genetic test tests positive for one of the causative mutations, that's very helpful. But if there has not been a contracture test in a family and someone just goes directly for uh, genetic testing, a negative result is not very helpful at all because we don't know uh, what the cause of mutation is within that family uh, uh, ancestry. So it's most important that if in question, uh, you contact one of the MH biopsy testing center directors or genetic counselor to be advised of the pros and cons of the different type of testing available. So that is an introduction to the current issues regarding some non-anesthetic triggers and a little bit about the controversy of MH biopsy testing versus genetic testing. And at this point, I'll stop with those introductory comments and Tina will take over and ask a couple of poll questions possibly, and then we'll continue on with the other panelists as well. Great, thank you so much, Joe. That was fantastic as always. Um, for those of you, before I launch the next poll question, I, we did have quite a significant amount of people join um, during this during that presentation. Um, so for those of you just joining us, you have a orange, I, I believe it's orange, an orange hand at the top right corner of your screen. That's going to alert me that you would like to ask a verbal question to our experts. If you'd like to just ask a question and you don't want to speak out loud, you can always just type it into the questions box, I will receive it, and then when it's time to discuss, I will ask those questions out loud to our experts for an answer. Okay, so let's go ahead and launch that poll question. Do you or have you ever experienced heat-related symptoms? I'll give everybody a few moments to, to answer. Okay, just a few more seconds here. Looks like everybody's still weighing in. Okay, wonderful. Thank you guys very much. So it looks like 63% of our audience do indeed or have experienced heat-related symptoms. 31% have not, and 6% don't even know what that means. So I'm going to pass this over to, uh, to Stacy and let her explain a little bit about heat-related symptoms and what that might what that might mean. Stacy? Absolutely. Hello again, everybody. Um, well, when you talk about heat-related symptoms, when it comes out on the athletic field or even when you're out walking your dog and, and not competing in an event, um, some report feelings of muscle pain, muscle cramping, um, really quick onset of weakness, so easy fatigability. Um, you just can't walk very far. And when you do, you get, the cramping becomes almost unbearable. Um, and it can actually lead to a decrease in activity over time. It can be some field progressive and can also have some joint pain um, involved as well. Um, these symptoms can progress and some have even reported, you know, feelings of headache, dizziness, and a little bit of um, palpitations on occasion as well. Um, so the heat, there is a gambit and sort of a, a very wide spectrum of symptoms that people experience that are, are heat related. Um, so again, it's very individual in how it presents itself, but they're all important things to, to bring to your primary care doctor. Great, great, thank you so much, Stacey. Um, Cheryl, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on this too, as far as heat-related symptoms. Do you experience any yourself, or do you have any advice for those who who might? My apologies, Cheryl. Oh, now you sorry. Should be able to be heard. Uh, hi. <laughs> it, yeah, I have re I have experienced symptoms. Um, I've um, been into the ER with a very elevated CK level after biking. Um, 
definitely have cramping on a regular basis. And, and something I do is take um, 25 milligrams of dantrolene on a daily basis to uh, alleviate and sometimes just minimize those symptoms. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so I think that that covers the, the presentation side. We do have quite a bit of questions coming in, so we can actually start um, start talking about those. And again, remember that if you have a question that you'd like to, to directly ask our experts um, verbally, remember to raise your hand so that I can take you off of mute so that you can speak to us. Um, all right, so the very first question I have, I think would be best for Cheryl. What is the best way to inform new primary care about my MH susceptibility? And this question was from Peggy. Cheryl? Peggy, I think what is vital is to have um, medical records with you when you go to a new primary care provider. Um, that way they can see firsthand and in writing the um, background and history of your malignant hyperthermia diagnosis. I know that I've run up against practitioners who say, why do you think you have that? And I have found over the years, it's definitely helpful to have a letter from the uh, registry, the MH registry, as well as my, my personal medical records to provide to the, to the new practitioner. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, we have another question that came in from Rosemary. I have read that occasionally avoidance of the trigger agents exposes patients to extra risks which have to be taken if the patient is known to be susceptible to MH. Dr. Tobin also mentioned that clean techniques, techniques, drugs have their own risks. Could you please explain this further? Joe? Sure, that's great questions, thank you. First off, one of the important things that any and all of us uh, are as patients is we may be an unexpected patient because we're involved in a traumatic incident such as a car crash. One of the most important priorities when we have an unconscious patient from a traumatic event is we want to get their breathing tube in as fast as possible. And the fastest drug for us to be able to make the vocal cords relax is succinylcholine. And succinylcholine is one of the triggers of malignant hyperthermia. So if the patient is not previously identified with a uh, ID band that says MH susceptible, they may receive succinylcholine with, with good intention, but it may also still trigger their illness. We suggest a medical alert band so that a person could be quickly screened and an alternative drug could be used that will get the vocal cords to relax to allow the breathing tube to pass. But that alternate drug takes a little longer to work and so therefore, there's the risk of aspiration from someone's stomach when they are unconscious uh, over that extra number of seconds that it takes for that uh, relaxing drug to work. That's the first problem. The second is that in the operating room, in order to guarantee that a patient is asleep and that they will not have any awakefulness while they're having surgery, we use the drugs that are called the volatile anesthetics. Those are very potent drugs that help keep you asleep and not forming any memories while you're having your surgery. If we cannot use those drugs, which are also triggers of malignant hyperthermia, then the alternative drug is an intravenous drug called propofol. And depending on the dose used, if an insufficient dose is used, there is the risk of wakefulness under anesthesia. And that can be a very problematic symptom for a patient to have to report after the surgery is over. And we certainly don't want people to experience pain during surgery. We want them unconscious. And this is a particular problem for people that have high use of opioid or narcotic type of medication or people that have excessive alcohol uh, ingestion because they grow tolerant and they begin to metabolize the drug propofol faster. We don't have an absolutely accurate monitor in the operating room to guarantee unconsciousness, which is why we rely on the vapor anesthetics so ubiquitously. Um, so the alternatives to, uh, that are used in the clean technique are, are very good. They're very real, but they do have slight increased risks over the conventional use of the triggering agents that we use every day. 
great. That's very interesting. Thank you, Joe. I hope that answered your question, Rosemary. If not, feel free to, to ask an additional one. Um, I do have somebody raising their hand. Um, Amanda, I'm going to go ahead and take you off mute. That will allow you to, to speak with our expert. Thank you. Amanda, are Hi, you there? Can, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Wonderful. Go ahead. Thank um, I might be asking something totally off base, so if I am, just let me know. Um, do you dis can you discuss any part of an awake malignant hypothermia? I think we can. And uh, Stacy, would you like to start, and maybe I can chime in secondly with that? Oh, that sounds reasonable. All right, Amanda, great question. Um, awake malignant hyperthermia episodes are episodes that typically occur outside of the operating room or basically when a patient's not exposed to anesthesia where they'd be put to sleep. So that's why the name awake would come into play. Um, awake episodes in anesthesia are typically what we've been talking about, either exercise or heat related um, in triggers. We're still trying to find out more about, about MH and how it associates or relates to heat related illness. Um, so we, again, are looking more into this field, but we found that having that stressor, um, either through heat or exercise, um, can mimic or have an episode that's very like or alike to malignant hyperthermia. Um, they have the same um, rigidity that can develop, the elevated heat, um, the hyperkalemia, all the, all the things that um, Dr. Tobin has spoken to you about it comes to fulminant episodes outside the operating room. And those are typically when they occur are being treated as a malignant hyperthermia outside of the operating room. That's why the importance in the identification of, of what's happening with the patients um, and history of those heat cramps and muscle fatigue, those are all important indicators that need to be brought to the primary care team so that if you're having these warning signs, um, there's always that in the background looming, Does is this possibly um, susceptibility to malignant hyperthermia? Again, we're still finding out if this, the link, more about the link between these two, um, but those are important things to need to be brought to your primary care team and, and investigated. Um, so that, I hope, is that sort of where you're going with the question? Yeah, um, my, my little bit of history is I have a seven-year-old daughter we adopted from Ethiopia. We weren't aware. Um, come to find out, she does have the RY, R1 genetic mutation. Mm -hmm. And she was sick with a virus over a weekend and um, was sick Thursday, took her to a pediatrician. By Sunday night, she ended up having a cardiac arrest on me. And, oh, my goodness, um, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so while she was in the PICU, they kept, they nobody could figure out what was going on. I mean, she was intubated, she was in a coma state. Um, they were blaming all of her symptoms and saying she was having um, brain neurostorming when come to find out now based on her calcium levels, her potassium levels, um, she was in an awake malignant hypothermia. So I'm wondering how long can someone be in that state? Because what ended up happening to her because she was, fighting so hard her electrolytes, she suffered a traumatic brain injury as well due to the oxygen from this event. So we've had quite, um, had quite, quite the course, my goodness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this was, I'm so sorry, that was probably a long question, but this was so no, important. No, you guys did this no today. it's important. It's important to talk about too. Um, yeah. And this is the ideal, this ideal venue to, to talk about these type of things. Because um, again, you're correct in that, again, awake episodes are outside the operating room and there are multiple triggers and we're finding more every day. And there's a lot of physiologic stress can be one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like your doctors were, th eventually got, got hold of the concern. Dr. Tobin, did you want to talk more about um, pharmacokinetics on that or? Well, I, I'll add at least a couple of points. Um, uh, unfortunately, your story is not in isolation. I can tell you I'm aware of other families that have had such health crises with their children, including families I've taken care of. Um, when, a, when a child appears to be getting a, a fever and an illness where they're aching and their, their muscles might ache, and we just think it's what we call myalgias, the first thought that's going to run through an emergency doctor's mind or a primary care doctor is, that, is this influenza or para-influenza and assume that it can be treated with non-steroidals and fluids and the patient will recover. And that's probably quite true for a great many of presentations like that. But in someone like your daughter who we didn't know had the RYR1 mutation until afterwards, 
Um, we are concerned that some of these viral states where we get inflammation could not only cause an MH to be triggered, an MH episode, but they could also result in something called myocarditis or cardiomyopathy, which it can, it can mimic uh, other signs and symptoms of malignant hyperthermia. And again, the diagnosis could be missed. It is a very complicated situation when you come in with that kind of a short but real brief history. Um, and uh, uh, now, uh, hoping she's had as much of a successful recovery as possible, uh, it, it's essential that should she come down with another febrile illness, um, that she be monitored more closely than most other children or young adults because of her potential to get into a cycle where she could trigger another malignant hyperthermia episode. It's really unpredictable as to who will or who will not. Um, so we, we feel and we empathize with what you've gone through, um, but it, the risk will persist. If she does seem to have chronic symptoms of pain now, uh, that would be something to potentially discuss with a neurologist about treatment with either uh, dantrolene or baclofen to see if the muscles are overactive and they could become relaxed. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Amanda, did that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. No problem. I'm going to go ahead and mute you back up. Of course, raise your hand if you have another question or send it okay. in with the chat box. Mm -hmm. We do have a, uh, quite a few questions now coming in through the questions box. Um, I have a couple from Karen, and I wanted to try to address most of them. Um, the first one is, does blood pressure induce MH or daily weightlifting? So I'm thinking what, what's meant here is that does daily weightlifting or blood pressure um, spikes or decreases induce MH. Um, Stacy, I'm going to give you some time to answer this one. Maybe you might know more or know about this particular question. Well, as an ex-power lifter, I can tell you, um, <laughs> you can get muscle fatigue, but um, usually that's due to the repetitive lifting. But in, in this, Ralph, when you're talking about blood pressure, um, it really, unless you're a susceptible patient, and it's like I always attribute it to this. If you were thinking of like the firefighter, the triad, where you have to have you have to have a oxygen source and a, something to burn, and then the fire spark itself. MH is sort of a dyad. You need to be a susceptible patient and put with the fire or the triggering agents or some type of event that would stress the patient into triggering. So in in weightlifting, when you're really straining the muscles and in doing heavy lifting and really fatiguing the muscles quickly or a marathon running, it's almost like you're you're putting a, a larger fire, if you will, and it has to have a susceptible patient. So if you're not susceptible, um, you're not you're going to get fatigued and tired, but you're not going to have that same symptomatology as a patient that is malignant hyperthermia susceptible would have. Um, and that's yeah, sort of like you have I'm to have sorry. Both. I'm going to interrupt you. I believe her. Um, she's she's asking. I think about her son. Her son is MA susceptible. He was honorably discharged from oh, the okay. army. Um, and she'd also like to know, in addition to those questions, basically, would those trigger MH? But would being a police officer cause problems with the disease? Um, he does exercise daily. Uh, what should he look out for that might potentially be dangerous? Okay, I apologize. I went offline a little bit for you. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, obviously, um, knowing about that you have that he's mis MH susceptible is incredibly important and notifying, I don't think it would preclude him from any um, employment, especially, you know, serving our country and serving the police force. Um, I think that's very honorable and should be encouraged. The important thing is knowledge and sharing that and communicating with those around you. Um, so obviously when he's going through um, training, when he's assigned to tasks um, and the, the core itself needs to know that he's MH susceptible so that if he does experience um, symptoms of a, of a trigger, um, that they can adequately care for him and know of the existence of his background and can get him the care he needs quickly. And that's the best, that's the most important part of this. Um, and as far as lifting weights, obviously, if, if it's done in a fashion where, again, those around him in the training facility knows he's MH susceptible and doing it and knowing your body and, uh, and training correctly, um, those are all important things. And as you heard one caller before, and this is, again, a decision that has to be made with, between the primary and the patient, long discussion, um, and taking dantrolene. Um, but that's something that I would always advise um, people to talk with an MH consultant, um, their primary, get that conversation going and individualize the patient care 
to what he's experiencing and, and how we could best serve him. Great, great. Thank you, Stacey. Karen, I do see your other questions, but for time's sake, um, we will answer those via email um, after the webinar. We have another question from Kurt. Um, he's, Kurt states, like so many of us who have MH, my CK levels run high on a regular basis and I am a competitive swimmer. My workouts can raise that level close to 1,000. Are there any concerns that we should have because of those levels? Can it affect organs or anything in a negative way? And what can be done to help drop those levels naturally? Um, Joe, do you have any insight on this? Well, um, not as much as hopefully a neurologist would have, but um, I'll try to answer at least a part of Kurt's question. The CK level of 1,000 is not particularly high. Uh, for those that are not familiar, the, the normal range varies by hospital and how they do the test, but somewhere in the 150 to 350 range, depending on the reference laboratory. So being three times normal, and it's there a lot or chronically, suggests that there's just continued instability of some muscle cells, and there's been some small amount of release of the muscle protein into the uh, bloodstream. So the elevations are there. And almost 50% of people who have chronically elevated CK test positive by the caffeine halothane contracture test to be MH susceptible. Now, assuming Kurt already has been tested or he knows that he's MH susceptible because of a family history, one of the best exercise programs that someone could do would be swimming as he's doing because there'd be a natural loss of heat from the body that is generated by the exercise itself. So it might help prevent him from hitting a critical body temperature where it becomes a trigger to make the MH syndrome become more fulminant. Um, again, any athlete should just uh, understand their limitations and not drive themselves to exhaustion where we do think that they could be at a greater risk to trigger an MH episode. Um, that's my preliminary thought on a, on a very important question. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. I have a question here, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name, from Marisarina, or Ma Masarina. Um, her child has had an MH episode back in April during surgery, um, and she would like to, she, the child was tested for a CPK test right after exercising, and it compared it with a previous basal test, and they'd like to, she'd like to know um, if this test is conclusive about exercise triggering MH on the child. Um, Stacey, do you have any insight? Um, in, in just not even knowing the numbers um, in that information, in that question that was posed, um, I don't know if you'd get all the information that you need in regards to um, if they were truly susceptible to exercise for for having an MH trigger. Basically, um, you can get you could see that there is a constantly elevated or if there is a spike in elevation of the CK after exercise. Um, that's important information to, to know, but there would be a lot more um, information to be required, at least in my opinion, to, to go forth and, and get diagnosed with like having an awake triggers to malignant hyperthermia. Um, but those, again, those are very important discussions to have with the primary and to get further testing. I always say if you're, if you're concerned and you're having that resting symptomatology, talk to an MH consultant. Um, find out about getting um, possibly muscle biopsy and getting tested, um, and then going on for genetic testing. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, Cheryl, I have a question here for you. Um, it's from Beth. She'd like to know if, if her daughter or herself um, end, up end up going to the ER with heat-related symptoms, what is the best advice to tell or convince the ER staff that it's not just heat stroke? but something more serious and should be treated as an MH episode. The reason I'm gonna pass it to you, Cheryl, is because you have some experience with these symptoms, so what is it that you usually tell your doctors? Um, definitely carry the um, MH card with you that explains um, malignant hyperthermia. Um, I, I have personally spoken with the ER uh, doctors in my local area, and made them aware of my situation. And the the one time that I did present with a, a CK over 10,000, they were willing to get on the phone and talk with an MH um, expert and follow the directives that they they provided, which was to um, hydrate 
and provide um, pain relief for me. And um, I, I, I feel confident that my local folks understand. Now, if I were traveling, I would, I would definitely want to have a copy of the letter with me from the um, registry. I would also want to have the specific guidelines for myself as an individual that I would expect be addressed if I were to present to an ER with, with symptoms as I've had in the past. And I, I, everyone is very individual. And um, because I've experienced worsening symptoms over time, I've definitely become more of an advocate for myself with my local practitioners. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. All right. Uh, Stacey, do you have any input on how someone might talk to an ER staff who may not be knowledgeable to, to tell them that you are related, you are um, experiencing heat-related symptoms to MH? Um, as far as communication with any healthcare provider, it starts with, with being honest and open about what you're experiencing, your symptoms, um, telling them what your history is. Having information is vital. If you have that information available, such as cards or anything to start the discussion to say, to give them a trigger of this is real, but also to bring to them to um, M House would be very important as well and say, listen, um, this is a great resource. I'd like you, you know, if you have a moment, just contact them. They could, they'll help guide us, us, because it's going to be you, your ER provider, your primary, and M House together as a team to help take care of you. Um, so the first thing is to just be open and honest, communicate what you're feeling and how, what you're, you know, what symptoms you're having, and um, start the conversation. And again, bring M House into it. I think it's a very important first step. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I just want to remind everybody that you can also verbally speak to our experts. Um, you don't have to be shy. This is a safe place for you to ask your question. The next question that I have here is from Eric. Eric says, we are parents of a two-year-old that had an MH event just before he turned one. What are some things we should watch out for on a day-to-day -day basis that could indicate he is having a problem? Additionally, what would be the best testing option for the two of us? Um, Joe, why don't you uh, why don't you take this one? Uh, yeah, two very distinct questions. Um, the first one, let's go with his um, with their son's development. I think the most important thing you can be watchful for is is he developing normally from a neurologic sense. Is he making the same milestones as other children? Has he got the same gross and fine motor skills? And we'd like to be sure there's just not a, a secondary muscular related disease that is slowly developing that should be looked at and evaluated early. Um, there are a number of diseases which are associated with MH susceptibility. One is called central core disease. And that can only be diagnosed with a certain type of biopsy test, but, but that is a, what's called an anatomical test. So it does not have to be done at the contraction uh, biopsy centers. Um, if he's developing normally, I would say there's nothing further to do. Now, the options for a mom and dad are complicated. Uh, the first is that one or the other could volunteer to be biopsied. Um, as the gold standard test, if they believe that they've got muscle disease running on one side of the family or the other, we would want to start with the parent on that side. Sometimes there's no history of muscle disease in the family, and I wind up having to biopsy test both parents to try to avoid not having to biopsy the child. But then here's a problem. Um, if mom and dad both tested negative, then we have to question, was the child's clinical episode truly MH, or possibly the child themselves has a new uh, previously unassociated genetic abnormality that has made them predisposed to MH susceptibility. That's very complex, I understand. So let me go back and just try and answer this. Um, the first option are for mom and dad to potentially get sequentially biopsied. First one, and if it's not positive, then the other. If the parents didn't want to do that, they could themselves volunteer and, and pay out of pocket for their own genetic testing um, because most insurance companies will not pay that. But the problem is if the genetic testing is negative, it still doesn't prove that their child is negative. Um, if, the, if either mom or dad are positive uh, for one of the causative mutations, 
then the child can be tested just with a blood sample looking specifically for that exact mutation. And that's a lot less expensive than the screen that was done on the mom or the dad. Now, if um, the uh, final issue is if mom and dad could neither afford it nor travel um, to get biopsied, then we would recommend that the child later get biopsied. And that means usually at least age five, and they would, we want them to weigh at least 40 pounds. And that is because when we take the strip of muscle from the leg, uh, we don't wanna leave a cosmetic or a muscular uh, deficiency. And so when we get a child who's at least this weight, the healing is very good and they don't have any loss of power of the muscle in their leg because they've got plenty of leg muscle. So uh, lots of options. That is a complicated enough question that I'd be happy to answer uh, them offline uh, because it may take a 10 or a 15 minute conversation. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, Joe, while I have you, uh, Peggy came back with a follow-up to her to her beginning question. Um, and she'd like to know where we might find the latest research on heat-related MH. Um, she is MH susceptible verified by a muscle biopsy test, and she runs half mm -hmm. marathons regularly and does not do well mm -hmm. in the heat. Um, actually, this might cover a lot of our questions. Basically, people want to know, what can I do to prevent a heat-induced event, and what do I need to look out for? Well, I think both Stacy and I will try to um, answer this, and then Cheryl as well from the patient's perspective, what other advice has she previously been given? Um, so where are the sources of the newest um, scientific information? Um, there's an open database run by the National Institute of Health, and you can get to it online. It is called PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. And if you Google that, it'll take you directly to the database of all the current electronic versions of literature. The, the, the more common articles will probably be in uh, journals such as called Muscle and Nerve. But what you could do is there's a search function in that website that you could just type in either malignant hyperthermia or exercise-induced malignant hyperthermia. Any, anything you want to try and search, you can put into the search field. Uh, then, um, looking carefully and discussing with your uh, um, uh, physician, uh, what would be the best recommendations and is the science solid or are these recommendations based on best practice? Um, and I think that that would be how I would advise people to do that or call us back at M House and be referred as a non-emergent question to an MH specialist. Stacy, I'd like to ask you to address what do you think is the best preconditioning for someone who is MH susceptible before they're about to undergo some intense exercise? Um, what I always advise anyone that's MH susceptible that's about to start an exercise program is obviously what I mentioned before is talk to your primary, make sure that your training partner knows about it. Um, and then it's watching yourself, signs and symptoms, hydrating um, appropriately prior to exercise, gradual um, training programs. So don't jump into marathon training immediately. Start with either a walking regimen, then move on to running. Um, always train with a partner so that you have the ability to call out, um, especially if you're experiencing symptoms and they're rapid onset. So I always advise everyone to have a training partner, even if you're obviously not MH susceptible, but you should have someone on the ready and that knows about what to do if you get into trouble. Um, Obviously, you know, training in areas that um, that have access to healthcare facilities or emergency medical um, treatment are important as well. So you just don't want to run out into a field somewhere, especially in your first training exercise alone, where you don't have the access to, to healthcare to get you help if you need. Um, but a lot of the training um, should start out with especially really knowing, knowing your limitations and being very aware of not pushing yourself to that overexhaustion limit where you're going to actually exacerbate your symptoms and potentially get into trouble. Okay. Wonderful. Would you Thank ever you. recommend an active cooling vest, um, Stacy? I haven't. Um, I have had one patient that utilized it and had some success. They were out actually um, rowing and they, they thought the heat um, beating down on them actually helped with the active cooling vest. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of them, I, I just advise, number one thing is hydration. Um, I see more people getting into trouble that don't hydrate adequately even before they start exercise. I say, 
about an hour leading up to your exercise event, you really need to push the fluids. Um, and also don't exercise out in the hot sun, watch the time of day that you're exercising and picking a sport like you mentioned with swimming that would cool or it would be not done in the hot sun or shade. And I know, especially with training, if they're going out for football and you don't want, you wanna be supportive, they're out in like that September sun, um, you know, the nice Indian summers that we have, sometimes the hot, the heat gets out there. Having um, cooling areas, ice baths are good, um, especially post-training, it will increase recovery time, but also decrease um, that muscle, um, fatigue and, and also help distribute that heat that patients experience afterwards. So um, oftentimes if you're running a marathon or you're even doing a fun run event, sometimes they'll have um, physical, uh, the athletic trainers in the end have ice baths. Those are great to utilize. Um, again, anything that can cool your body and hydrate your body are important things and as well as physical awareness. I can't stress that enough. Knowing where your break point is and your limitations are and working within them. Sure. And again, train with a partner. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's wonderful advice. And I think that it leads into the next question that I have here from Amanda, who we spoke with earlier. Um, because her daughter is seven and with her injury, what does she need to look out for? Because her daughter is not necessarily able to verbalize when she's having muscle pains or weakness or things like of that sort. So do you have any um, classic signs or something along that line that she should look for on somebody else? Uh, again, it's a, it's a challenging question, but thanks for bringing it forward. Uh, nobody knows a child, particularly a child with um, special needs, better than their mom and dad. So the things I would at least consider are, do, do they see facial expressions or patterns of inconsolability? Or normally are the muscles relaxed and now they seem to be in a sustained uh, uh, effect of being uh, rigid? Either of those circumstances would at least uh, generate a phone call for a possible primary care visit to determine if um, uh, there's something more that should need to be done. Um, having a core temperature and a heart rate uh, could be valuable uh, to the pediatrician or the primary care doctor as well. So learning how to take a pulse and um, uh, being able to do a rectal temperature would both be valuable as far as signs that there is a hypermetabolic state that may be coming on, in which case then it might require a visit to the ED. Great, great. Thank you. Um, we only have a few more minutes left, but there are a couple of pretty um, important questions I want to address. The first one is, is there a possibility to, I'm sorry, before I read that, uh, Dr. Henry Rosenberg is also with us today, and he wanted me to mention that, to remind all of you that if there is a suspicion of MH in any situation, to remind your practitioner or healthcare provider that they may communicate with the MH hotline or be in touch and or be in touch with one of the in-house experts at no charge. So if you go to the emergency room and you're trying to convince them that that might be heat-related MH, you can encourage them to call the MH hotline. Um, the, the question that I was going to ask was, is there a possibility to survive an MH episode without dantrolene? Because there are some countries that just don't carry it. Um, and that would also go hand in hand with the traveling question that we received a little while ago about whether or not all countries have dantrolene. Um, Joe, can you elaborate? Um, I've traveled a fair number of countries in the world, including some that do not have dantrolene. So it's important to understand what is the medical system of the country you're going into. I have a couple of uh, patients that have been professional travelers who are MH susceptible. They've actually had a prescription written so that they could take dantrolene with them from the United States. That's not necessarily easy to do, and you can't, I can't prove to you that it won't be confiscated at the border, but with the right documentation and the prescription for dantrolene, you would at least have the antidote or rescue medication with you in case you needed an emergency appendectomy, for example. Um, uh, what was the other part of the question, Tina? I believe that was that was it, just about traveling with a mage and okay. um, people not having dantrolene. Um, Amanda wanted Yo, to weigh in. Just, I'm sorry? Yes, one other point. Are there survivors of an MH episode who did not receive dantrolene? And the answer is yes. Uh, um, I'm okay, I think, I think we lost Joe, but... While we're waiting for him to connect back in, um, 
I just want to sample. Stacy, Cheryl, Diane, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I was still here. Um, Amanda wanted to weigh in on that question about Dantrolene. Her daughter, who had the episode, did not receive Dantrolene, and she survived. So there is evidence that that does, does indeed happen. Um, I think because we lost Joe, or lost, the question I was going to ask, uh, Peggy, if you're listening, we will follow up with you outside of this webinar um, about your question with the um, triggering anesthetics and whatnot. Yeah, this is Joe. I'm sorry. Some somehow must have cut us cut us off. Oh, there you are. That's okay. Um, we're going to move on to the next question um, from Brooke, and I think that we're going to. This will be our last question. Um, Brooke is currently 30 weeks pregnant with her second child. Her first pregnancy, her symptoms um, were actually seemed less, less cramping, less pain, less muscle weakness. This pregnancy is almost the opposite. Is there any reason why the increase or decrease in symptoms? Uh, is she known to be MH susceptible, the caller or the questioner? Um, Brooke, if you can hear us, can you, can you, yes, she is. Okay. Um, I don't have a, a, a good explanation of why the pregnancies might be so different. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is one's a girl and one's a boy, and I can't tell you which one's going to be more challenging. I take that <laughs> for the joke that I tried it to be. Um, but uh, if there's any concerns about uh, worsening muscle pain during a pregnancy that you believe is way out of control compared with the previous pregnancy, it's worth seeing the obstetrician and getting muscle enzymes uh, measured. Because if there is substantial muscle breakdown, that may be a reason for someone to go on bed rest or get intravenous hydration in order to successfully continue the pregnancy. Uh, we don't necessarily know if there's a difference in medication that might be adding to it. Um, or just the difference in her physiology. But uh, if the symptoms are more aggravated, I would wanna have the muscle enzymes tested and then make a determination about uh, adequacy of hydration and rest for the rest of the pregnancy. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I hope you were able to answer at least most of your questions. Remember that we will answer all of the questions outside of the webinar if we were not able to get to yours. We did receive a lot of questions um, which stresses maybe we need to do this more often. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to uh, Executive Director Diane Doherty. Diane? Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. As Executive Director at M-House, I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, Drs. Joe Tobin and Stacy Watt and, of course, Ms. Cheryl Mercer for sharing their valuable insight. I hope everyone attending has gained new information or clarification. Our goal is to open the door to communication and share areas of concern and or confusion. We will continue to listen to what you have to say and incorporate it into products and or programs that might make your life a little bit easier. Our website at mhouse.org offers much in the way of MH information and a way to reach us via the contact button at the top of the site. Consider a yearly MHouse membership to gain member benefits such as 30% off most MH educational purchases. As a membership-based organization, we focus on patient safety from MH events. We welcome, of course, tax-deductible donations as a solid base for MHouse to continue to offer MH education and the MH hotline. We're so glad you could join us for this webinar. I hope you found it helpful. Feel free to share any feedback or suggestions or ideas for improvement. We're always searching for ways to make those quality improvements to our program. Thank you, everyone who made this event so successful. Great. Thank you so much, Diane. And thank you to everybody who's attended and all of our volunteer panelists. We certainly appreciate it. Um, one last thing before we end the webinar, I'd like to ask all of the people who have attended to complete the short survey that will pop up on your screen when you close the control panel using the X in the top right corner. We do appreciate your support. Um, and as an aside, I forgot to mention, we do have some handouts here. If you would like, we have um, a, some patient safety checklist, an emergency care um, checklist, or um, document and the roadmap is all available here in the control panel and on our website. So if you don't get it from here, we'll make sure when we post a video online, it'll be an additional resource. Again, we appreciate everybody's support and wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Thank you and feel free to email any additional questions. Have a great day. Bye-bye.